Matt Fink, David Shaw, James Sanders, Shane Khan and I will be looking at the news in quantum tech globally, take a deep dive into a topic and review progress on our predictions. This is the Analyst Roundtable. I'm James Sanders with 451 Research, which is part of S&P Global Market Intelligence. I'm Shaheen Khan with OrionX.net. I'm David Shaw with Fact-Based Insight. I'm Doug Fink with the Quantum Computing Report. Welcome, everybody, to the Analyst Roundtable, Season 1, Episode 3. I am joined by my fellow experts, Doug Fink, David Shaw, James Sanders, and Shaheen Khan. We will explore what is new in quantum tech uh, over the last four weeks and take a deep dive into quantum security. Welcome, guys. How's everybody doing? Doing great. Doug, very you're in Chicago you. attending the March meeting, right? Yes, I am. Yeah, it's very interesting. Good. Awesome. We'll, we'll, we'll look forward to some news uh, from there. We'll uh, talk a little bit less about the uh, investment activity uh, this time around. Uh, just uh, to switch it up a little bit, uh, our friends at uh, Alice and Bob uh, in France, a uh, great job. Another uh, 30 million for their cat qubit approach to quantum computing. Uh, also, I've been proven wrong. I'm always the one who is skeptical about uh, seed stage funding and, and early stage, but there's been over a handful of uh, uh, seed stage deals, not just in quantum computing for software and, and other things, but also in quantum communications and, and QKD. A uh, great job there. And uh, obviously, Rigetti finally uh, going public uh, on NASDAQ. Uh, guys, what uh, what are your thoughts on investment activity uh, over the last uh, four weeks? Uh, uh, Shaheen, I, I see you nodding. Well, I think money continues to pour in, which is uh, quite wonderful in some ways, because we all want this technology to move forward, and it is doing that. On the other hand, as money pours in, it also raises the uh, concern that can we can we deliver with everything that we promise and and are we rapidly running towards a quantum winter when people might uh, you know if it, it's going to take 10 years and the expectation is two years that could be a problem so I think it's a balance that hopefully the industry is going to strike well but uh, for now the party's on yeah James the party is on I I'm not sure. I, I have a little concerns about the scalability of Rigetti's system. It said in the press release that the, the CLOPS ranking for the 40 qubit system was 844, but the 80 qubit system is only at 892. So I, I'm really curious what the roadmap is, is going to look like and how they're going to start connecting multiple uh, qubit devices together to build a, a scalable quantum system. Yeah, one thing I would comment is, you know, we're starting to see a little bit of concern in the markets, the financial markets about quantum you know i've always told people this is a long-term investment don't expect to flip a, a quantum investment but you know in the case of rigetti um you know one interesting thing is when they did go public uh, there were all, actually a lot of redemptions of the spac so that people did not stay in and they got a little bit less money a little bit less cash than they originally thought they might get and in addition, uh, you know, the, their stock has gone down. Uh, the stock price, they went public at 975. And I, I, I checked them this morning and uh, where are they at? Uh, they're about uh, six or seven dollars now. So, so they've gone down. But, you know, in some, by the INQ sort of had some similar issues. You know, they went public at 10. They peaked at $31 a share. And now they're a little bit above $11 a share. So, you know, the, the markets are a little bit, you know, nervous, but, you know, some of that, of course, is the fact that markets are nervous about everything. So, um, you know, maybe that's a big factor too. Uh, just a, a shout out to, to congratulate the guys at uh, Alice and Bob for their, their, their fundraising and their new result. I think I think cat qubits are interesting for a couple of reasons, uh, you know, not, not just in their own sake, but in a, as the type of thing they are, they're an example of people to starting to combine thinking about how we do error correction and how we can design physical systems that fit better with that. 
So, you know, the concept is that they, they, they engineer it to suppress one particular type of error, the bit flips. And, and that gives the, them some advantages then that the rest of the error correction is, is simpler. And, and very in particularly, it looks like you can potentially have a much, uh, you, can, you can avoid the magic state bottleneck potentially. Uh, and that, that, that's, you know, it's interesting for their roadmap. And, and there, there's some similarities there, but what you can see, you know, uh, Microsoft also have this interesting result out where they, they've got the, the topological qubit uh, Majorana modes back on the, back on the, uh, on the, on the, the forward foot again. Uh, and, and, and similarly, that's another of these strategies that seeks to have a, a more favorable error correction journey. But, but though I like both of these things, they do strike me as, as, as early phase. We're talking about platforms where they've really demonstrated that you might be able to form a qubit. They've, they've not demonstrated that you can control that qubit. They've not demonstrated the fidelity that you can read it out, the one qubit, the two qubit gates, all of that's to come and will take a long time. So I don't think they in themselves uh, solve uh, the, 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 the problem that all the guys have been alluding to, that uh, the, you know, the, the, the valuations in the market are under pressure for systems that are, are trying to deliver on a much earlier timeline than that. And to uh, Doug's, go ahead, Doug. Yeah, I, I actually attended an error correction session yesterday at uh, APS, and there was one common theme that I saw, which is you really have to design the error correction scheme and the hardware really at the same time, because they're very heavily dependent on, on one another, and the topology used for the hardware is going to impact what error correction scheme you want to use. So I think what uh, we're seeing in the investment market is uh, in, indeed um, it's uh, getting a little uh, tighter. Maybe that winter is coming. It surely is a little cold in Miami today. At the same time, I'm talking to a group of high net worth individuals right now that want to put 350 million to work and uh, don't don't really know how good problem to have. But if like Alice and Bob, you have a clear differentiator, especially on the hardware side, uh, that uh, that is still very very possible. Back to Rigetti just uh, for a second and uh, uh, saying all of this with love and, and respect, of course. But what's always interesting after going public is these companies have to file their financials. So we learn a lot also about our projections and uh, how, how wrong or right we were. Uh, Rigetti announced $8.2 million in revenue, which is 48% uh, up uh, for the previous period and uh, a 6.6 .6 million dollar profit um, i haven't made it through all of their financials yet but uh, those numbers are astounding to me for many reasons uh, 48 percent growth is uh, amazing i don't know how you make 6.6 .6 million profit in quantum i don't know how you make 6.6 .6 million profit on 8.2 million revenue and 8.2 million revenue that's not a lot of revenue I think at this point, the numbers are really still very small and the deals are very lumpy. So there's really, it's impossible to really predict. So really just a comparison doesn't even really make sense in my mind. Uh, the supercomputing world can provide a glimpse of how that dynamics works. In the early days of supercomputing, when each system was $35 million and you could walk into a, you know, a city and say, where's the supercomputer? Everybody would know where that is. Uh, you had the same issue, is that if a deal moved from March to April, suddenly the company looked really terrible. If it moved from April into March, you were golden. So I think we need to like take all these numbers with a grain of salt for now. Yeah, the other thing I would mention, though, is if you look at Rigetti's analyst presentation from last October when they first announced they were going public, they did have a you know pro forma forecast, and they were predicting $7 million in 2021. So they at least did better than their October forecast, and you know that that's that, you know that's a good sign. You know they definitely look to be on track. I think the other upcoming event is INQ will be announcing their results. Uh, I think it's March 28th, and that'll be interesting to see. I think another aspect of it is how they do their accounting. You know whether they yeah. do the revenue based on cloud usage that comes in as you go, or do they count the sale to the cloud provider as one event and then they're done and you know so i think there's also that aspect but certainly access to the cloud can smooth out the lumpiness that i talked about earlier 
And uh, David, uh, to uh, move on uh, to the next topic, uh, Majorana is back. Uh, you, you alluded to it, uh, Microsoft, with a, a really uh, nice uh, publication uh, just uh, the other day where they were able to create a topological ground state that allowed for these topological gates or gaps, they are called, I believe. And they were able to measure them with uh, pretty good uh, results. Were very early steps. Uh, as you said, but uh, a huge announcement for, for Microsoft that has suffered a little bit for, for a long time. Yeah, and I think, I mean, the background here is that, uh, uh, you know, topological qubits, as they're, as they're called in a more generic sense, are, are a really a really great idea. We would love to have topological qubits. The idea is that they're qubits that effectively do the error correction in hardware. So you define a, a quantum state that's not as susceptible to the the typical types of errors that uh, that, that the other qubit platforms that, that we know uh, uh, appeal to, and and the actual mathematics of it is is heavily related to the mathematics of things like the surface code, which is a topological code. It's it's a similar idea, but implemented in hardware rather than in soft, but rather than software. Uh, and we thought, you know, unfortunately, a few years back, we, we thought we were a little bit further down the road to, on that journey uh, than it turned out we were because there were some some results that had been announced that appeared to observe these these uh, these states um, in, in nano superconducting nanowires, the types of state that you could then use to form a, a topological qubit. Um, but unfortunately, those results had to be retracted. They'd been published and, and you know, in all reputable journals, Nature, etc., and unfortunately, it turned out that that some of the data hadn't been handled, uh, you know, quite as it needed to be, and those results were were, were retracted, which is very embarrassing, um, and and that really knocked the the the, the window of the, the sales of of this uh, of this uh, technology, uh, this this qubit technology for, for for the last eighteen months or so, and so it's really interesting to see that no. Uh, Microsoft and the, the team at Station Q have have brought it back up to uh, where we where we had already hoped it was uh, of actually demonstrated the base states that you would then use to to um, uh, to uh, to go on and, and build these qubits. But it's it is very early days. So James Shaheen, Doc, help us uh, put this into context. Uh, is Microsoft? announcing uh, their first uh, hardware later this year with the uh, 100 qubits. Um, uh, what is the timeline? Um, how, how should we kind of understand this announcement? It's years away. Uh, this is a, a one step in a long journey toward building a scalable quantum system. And I would be incredibly surprised if, if Microsoft were to, uh, to announce a 100 qubit system this year. Um, it, it, it's definitely progress, and as David said, uh, it, it's nice to see this come back after, I think a lot of people had written off the idea um, of Majorana fermions really being achievable physically. So it, it is nice to see this, and it's nice to see that they've stayed with this research even um, even after these setbacks. Yeah, yeah. one thing I would recommend uh, that people would go to the Microsoft announcement. There's a very good video. It's about a half an hour video versus uh, the guy in charge of the program and, and a professor that really goes to it in a little bit of detail. Um, but one thing he mentioned, which I think is very significant, is the fact that the topological qubits will greatly reduce the errors, they believe, by several orders of magnitude, but it will not take them down to zero. So they will still need some error correction, I, I believe, even when they create their their pro, uh, their computer, but um, it will be much, much less error correction that will be needed in, in the other machines. I really appreciate that honesty because I think there's too many firms that want to try to convey what it is they're doing or what hardware they're building as being the silver bullet to solve the quantum computing problem as being the, the single platform. And in in cloud, you, you see this um, overplayed meme of being the, you know, single pane of glass or single source of truth. And that doesn't really exist, and it's not going to exist in this field either. So I, I really, really appreciate the the honesty that Microsoft has had with their journey in, into this uh, into this research. Just if if I could come come back as well uh, for a moment, you, what you, people might be sitting out there thinking, well, you know, if it's going to take that long, 
you know one of these other technologies is, is it, maybe it's going to get there first and it, is the, is it is it really worth continuing this this path uh and and i profoundly think it is uh, because even, even if we think one of the other existing architectures if you like is going to get there it, it's quite possible uh, that they'll get there but but really because of those overheads of the error correction there's there's a limitation on how fast that architecture can run these if you like first generation architectures and that puts pressure on will they really be able to run the applications which don't have quite as 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 powerful a quantum speed up so if got if i've got an application that has an exponential speed up then great one of these first generation architectures will run it fine but if i've got a class of problems which doesn't you know maybe only has a quadratic speed up then maybe these first generation architectures aren't actually going to be fast enough and 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 that's that's really relevant because there's a whole class there's a whole slew of potential business applications that fit squarely in there it's much more clear that you'll be able to get optimization benefits if you've got some second generation architecture that can run much more quickly perhaps because it doesn't have the same error correction overheads and so i i see you know a great future for guys even if they're on a, a slower time path you know related to this is the uh, quantum inspired uh, algorithms and area is that uh, you are at the end of the day competing with classical computers that are extraordinarily good and if I can come up with an algorithm and then I can more, you know, port it to a GPU and it is fast enough, then really that pushes the quantum computing alternative farther out if it is also more costly. So it really behooves the com quantum computing community to pursue all of these technologies until we actually get a real silver bullet. And I think that search is why we have so many architectures and we will continue to. And uh, to wrap up the news, because we want to move on to our deep dive, uh, a lot of other announcements over the last four weeks, new photonic devices, new records on uh, qubit coherence times, uh, uh, new qubit manufacturers. I think you can now order your qubits and you'll get them delivered within 31 days. If you're the holder of a black American Express card, please put your details in the comments. We'll let you know how that works out. And anything stands out uh, to any of you uh, over the last four weeks? Before we, 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 want, uh, we, we want Qubit as a service. <laughs> Qubit as a service, uh, yeah. Amazon Prime. There's a really interesting paper from the University of Chicago about a, a dual atom cesium rubidium device. Um, it's, it's basically a hybrid neutral atom system. And it's still in proof of concept now, but uh, I think that's really something interesting to watch. Good, I think we're ready to move on to our deep dive. and. Uh, Today, we're talking about uh, quantum cryptography. Oh, so, so difficult, can't even pronounce it, quantum cryptography, but it has many different names, quantum encryption, post-quantum cryptography, quantum safe encryption, quantum proof encryption, quantum resistance encryption, quantum security, quantum communications, and all these things mean the same, but uh, do have slightly different approaches and uh, we shall try to make a little bit sense of that essentially essentially it's um, all the idea of uh, how do you protect information and ensure uh, secure communication in the era of quantum computing this uh, threat of a quantum computer um when, when we get that silver bullet shaheen right being able to break existing security uh protocols and there are different ones we'll uh, discuss that in a second um, uh, but really two main approaches. Let me know if you agree with that or not. Um, how do you create a key or do you rather create entanglement in your system? And quantum key distribution, this idea of using photons to, to transport, transport your information, your data in, with a secure key in, in a network uh, of, 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 of uh, you know, exchanging um, information or post-quantum cryptography, crypt <laughs> I gotta get that word right, guys. Cryptography, cryptography um, uh, which is an algorithmic approach to uh, uh, securing your data. So why why is this even a problem, um, uh, Shaheen? You mentioned symmetric and asymmetric uh, security. There are many different uh, security protocols. Um, why is this a problem, and why should we care? Well, fundamentally, I think the end-to-end -end security problem is a very difficult problem. 
you don't really have this problem if it is just you holding your own secrets. The problem starts when you share that info with someone. So communication enters from the very, very beginning. So now you have people involved, communication involved, and the actual security of the data involved. And those are the three pillars that always make the whole problem at the end of the day, probabilistic rather than assured. So now, uh, how do you how do you secure this? You know, you can either you and I can agree on a password, and now we are done. That's a symmetric, uh, like the old days. Uh, but if we are not together, and if we do not have a trusted way of communicating upfront to do this, and and we have to worry about eavesdroppers, that kind of puts you into the asymmetric kind of security, and that's when you have the public private keys. And the quickest analogy that I can think of is that imagine you have three pigments of paint and I have my private paint and you have your private paint and then we have a public paint. If I mix my paint with the public one and ship that to you, then you can use that and add it to yours and you do the same thing and I get your mixed and add it to mine. We both get the same shade of paint, but everything that people have seen is just a mix of two of them, not all three. And they cannot unbake that. They can, you know, there are infinity ways of getting that. So it fundamentally relies on an algorithm that is really easy in one way. I mix the paint and I'm done. And really, really hard in the other way. I get the mixed paint and I don't know what two paints yielded it. Now, the problem is that this is a really hard problem until there's a new way, a new technology like quantum computing that says, you know what? It's not a hard problem anymore. <laughs> Right, And we have that right now. That is the situation right now where the Grover algorithm that says I can search for the right you know, input to get the output and Shor's algorithm that says I can decompose an integer factorization. Those have made what used to be difficult suddenly very easy in principle. Now, what prevents you from coming up with other ways of making hard things easy? You, you can't tell, right? So really that's where we are right now. So, how can we make the existing hard stuff like quantum safe? And, and, and how can we guard against future new algorithms that might in fact make it safe? So how serious is this problem? A, a couple of postdocs just a couple of months ago uh, released a paper uh, on you know, what would it take for a quantum computer to break the blockchain. And the verdict was we're at least 10 years, if not more, uh, away from a quantum computer to, to break that important blockchain. At the same time, uh, NATO and the White House, just in the last couple of weeks, uh, uh, issued guidance on the post-quantum threats with some very firm and um, you know, direct uh, timelines and, and, and directives. There's a, there's a key thing to, to understand here, which is that even future quantum computers are a threat now uh, because if someone, if, if some adversary uh, intercepts and, and, and stores my data now, they harvest my data, they, they, they can't decrypt it now because it's protected by our, our current cryptographic protocols. Uh, but when that more powerful quantum computer is available at some point in the not too distant future, then they'll be able to decrypt it then. And that, that harvest now decrypt later attack is a really important challenge uh, that uh, that people face now, and and if you, uh, you you've got to ask, what's the date at which you think such a, a sufficiently large, a cryptographically relevant quantum computer will be available? Yeah, one thing I would add, something amusing on the web, uh, the Cloud Security Alliance has just published a countdown clock, and they have magically chosen the date of April fourteenth. 2030 as the day when a powerful quantum computer will be available for uh, for breaking cryptography. So I'm going to give them my MasterCard right now and see if uh, I can get in line for delivery. But um, I think they really did it as a publicity stunt, just get people thinking about it, because David is right, is people need to start working on this right now because there are going to be billions of devices that are going to needed to be upgraded or replaced using the old you know key distribution technologies versus the quantum resistant ones so um it's going to take 10 years of effort by the it community to do that so it's a lot of work uh, very similar to the y2k 
thing, if any of you remember that from 20 years ago. Um, but one thing I should mention is that, you know, there, as we said earlier, there are two approaches. There's the physics-based approach, QKD, where you send photons. There's the software approach called PQC, post-quantum cryptography. And uh, NIST has been evaluating the PQC algorithms, and they have announced that they will make their first selection, what's called the round three selection, by the end of the month. So by the time that some of the people who are watching this video uh, see this video, it may have already been announced or will be announced very, very shortly. They will continue on. There will be a round four because they have some algorithms they want to look at more. But um, you know, with this announcement of round three selection, uh, you know, people really should start looking at converting their entire infrastructure now. It's going to take many years to do it. But uh, hold, hold on, guys. Um, uh, so you just mentioned the NIST competition, which began in 2017 with, I believe, 69 initial candidates. Now uh, seven finalists, uh, four, in, uh, four of them in key distribution, three in uh, signatures. And uh, one of them, the rainbow signature, uh, just got broken by, by an ordinary laptop. Um, have, have we really thought this through? If 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 I I I, I can re re reflect on that, and, and I, I want to start off by saying I've got tremendous respect for the NIST process and all of the uh, the you know very talented cryptographers that have driven that forward, and it's been it's ultimately a great service to the world that they're taking on getting uh, some solutions in place, uh, and it's also great that they've managed to keep the timescale on track because the timescale matters because of this harvest now decrypt later, because of the long transition period Doug was referring to, we need standard algorithms emerging now so that people can start that transition. Um, but they have had to operate under that time pressure. And that means in taking those 69 algorithms, they forced the pace and whittled it down. And in reality, best will in the world, they've been able to bring a certain amount of cryptanalysis to be in. And, and, and to be honest, you can get into some very different presentational styles here. You know, if I'm wanting to reassure the, the world that there's there's some cryptography that's going to keep the internet working and their secrets safe, then you've got to say, yes, this is great stuff. You should transition to it now. You've got to turn up in the boardroom and get people to spend money doing that. But there's there's two other debates going on, unfortunately. You, you roll it back then into, you know, look at the, the PQC forum as part of the NIST process. And the, the cryptographers are having a much more honest debate because, you know, that's that's what they want to do about, about the readiness. And and of course, there's there's natural people are pointing out that, well, we wish we had longer to test this and more to look into this problem. And, and the rainbow result is just an example of that. The NIST process always wanted people to come up with challenges and try to break these algorithms. And... And really, it's it's maybe perhaps great timing that we've had this one come out when it has, because it reminds us, it reminds us that we that we can't just take one of these computational techniques and assume it's safe as houses, because it's earlier days than that. And so, crypto agility is really important. But then, as I say, you know, that's that's one side of the debate. Unfortunately, there's another side of the debate now going out there in in the the marketing of so many quantum safe cryptography companies where the the presentational nuance of this is going completely out of the window in some cases just the the, the, the straightforward objectivity of the claims being made is, is completely out of the window and that's a terrible position for uh the you know the people in real businesses that have to evaluate these options and decide to spend money it's a terrible position for them have to be in to try to to weed through the, uh, the 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 rights and the wrongs of this, I'm going to be the voice of caution here, and I think I think the first thing, and, and to David's point, this is probably not really going to be a a one and done process. Like we we cannot just assume that this is going to be solved um, through a through a bureaucratic process, as important as that bureaucratic process is. Um, this is a very basic comparison, but if if you were to you know, install Windows 10 with the release to manufacturing version and then compare it to the latest patched update of Windows 10, you're, you have a completely different scenario on your hands about what the actual risk is there. 
Um, and to, to Doug's point, the, the, the premise that um, this is going to require significant amount of investment to upgrade a lot of infrastructure to be quantum ready is important and probably terrifying to people when you realize that this is going to be a continuous process. You can't just, you know, make one upgrade, say this is solved and move on to something else. Um, unfortunately, I'm also going to, to, to kind of rain on this parade and say, you know, what, what threat model are you actually working under? If you have something that you're doing today that you're worried about it being decrypted eight to 10 years later, what are you doing? What, what value judgment is happening here that you're worried about the possible, decry possible decryption in a sea of data if you're just doing a mass surveillance of encrypted data that someone at some point in the future is going to say, hey, this is interesting. We're going to spend the time and money to decrypt this eight to 10 year old information or you know something even older than that. What are you doing? What is your threat model? So that it is a concern, but I'm not sure how close that concern is. Um, that that is definitely one thing to consider when when making these value judgments. And yes, for for national security purposes, you should be worried about this. For enterprise technology, you might want to worry about this. For personal security, the things on your laptop, the things that you're doing. If you're concerned about um, you know, something be, being decrypted eight to ten years later, I'm really curious what you're doing. Um, I mean, when you think about uh, you know web transactions, buying things on the internet. I, I mean, my credit card expires every three years and I have to get a new number. So the value of that data eight, 10 years on isn't going to be very high for anyone. So I, I am really curious, um, you know, where these conversations lead about what uh, what is secure today and what will be secure tomorrow. Yeah, so, one, thing I, one thing I would add is when you think about cybersecurity in general, I think that things like vulnerability to phishing attacks, to having a poor password hygiene where, or even physical security to your computer room, I think those are way, way more critical and more important to your overall cybersecurity than someone being able to decrypt your communications. So people and they're just cheaper to put it in context. Yeah, I, I think that you do want to segment the value of what it is you're trying to protect. If it is intellectual property, if it's a secret to some recipe, like the you know famous uh, the, the consumer products that we've heard, or if it is financial transactions or state secrets, these are the things that even 30, 40 years from now would be valuable to some adversary. And I think you know the bad guys harvesting data now to encrypt it, decrypt it later is, is an issue. But then if uh, they also have to throw darts because they don't know what they're going to find. And, you know, imagine you have a quantum computer at, you know, millions of dollars, and now you're going to decrypt all this data looking for, you know, that piece of gold, you know, needle in the haystack in a big way. So you better start with a haystack that's likely to have some needles in it. And I think that, you know, limits the number of uh, organizations that really should be paying attention to this. And, and I hope that that's already the case. Even even with the ability for a quantum computer to decrypt this information, it's going to be still rather expensive to do, at least starting out. So it's probably less um, needle in a haystack than hay in a needle stack. <laughs> well, guys, I, 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 I agree at one level. I agree that understanding the use case is, is really essential in all of these, these crypto, crypto system things. But there are a couple of things about the, about the, the quantum situation that I think uh, are going to make it uh, one, you know, a, a snowball that continues to to gather gather momentum as it rolls downhill. You know, one is this, this you know, the, there are all these other ways that crypto systems get compromised, but there is something really different in nature about the, the quantum threat to our current cryptography. It's not that someone, you know, might forget and leave the window open. It's that the locks just don't work anymore. It's a systematic failure. It, it, it takes out, it, it's not somebody's dropped a USB stick in a car park. It's the, the whole layer at the bottom just is, is, is open. Uh, and, and one of the, the things that I think, I think 
it's going to make that more of a problem is the confidence question a lot of a lot of what we do on, on, on the net blockchain in particular but not just blockchain it, uh, cryptocurrency in particular, it's it's not always the the objective aspect it's do people have confidence to use that platform are they happy to have their details stored there are they happy to be transacting and having having money in a particular cryptocurrency and and once you get to the sentiment changing, I, I, I suspect that the sentiment may change rather quickly. Particularly if you're looking at, at, at some of these, these crypto platforms where you've got a vast proliferation of them. And in some sense, the ability to make the transition that some of them would need to make to put in place quantum safe versions of their platform, it depends on them having the sentiment that will encourage developers to stay engaged and do that transition for them. And, and I and I suspect that once people start to worry about this, is it the easiest thing for the developer to keep working and migrating that platform here that they they've been, or should they just move on to the the next one? And so I think you may end up with a lot of existing crypto system uh, infrastructure that gets a bit stranded, that that so can't rely on its momentum to migrate. Uh, uh, absolutely, and I'd, I'd like to bring us back to, to a more practical um, discussion for the last 10 minutes or so, at least for the part of our audience that is worried about the threat. Um, let's try to peel back the onion a little bit on, on the vendors, and, and we don't do vendor assessments or, or recommendations on this show. If, if you want that, give any of us a, a call and we'll be happy to work with you. Uh, you'll get a 10% discount if you mention the analyst roundtable. Um, so any vendor we mention, we, we do that uh, uh, in, in good faith. And, and, and as an example, I will pick on two New York-based companies, uh, Crypt, uh, located on top of the Freedom Tower in a beautiful uh, office, claims that they have the only true random number generator that is mathematically proven and fully transparent since, since they publish it. And they do that from a source of entropy and uh, using that uh, create a key which uh, Shaheen is uh, available as a service. So you have entropy as a service, key as a service, which uh, they of course say is uh, very secure and um, uh, uh, scalable, um, uh, both in its technical implementation as, as well as cost-based. Um, just across the East River in Brooklyn Navy Yard, you have a company called QNECT, and uh, QNECT takes this more uh, uh, software or algorithmic approach that Duck hinted on. Uh, where they create a, a pair of uh, um, you know, a photon source that creates a, a pair of uh, uh, entanglement. And um, um, th that allows you through a quantum memory and then quantum swapping uh, to have a fully entangled network that supposedly is, uh, is quantum safe. Um, if I'm uh, uh, listening to all of this, I'm worried about the threat and, and the White House um, uh, uh, you know, announcement, who do I call? Do I call somebody like Crypt that does the keys? Do I call somebody like QNEC that does the entanglement? How do I make sense of it? Okay, can I, can I have a quick go there? Because I, I, I want to flag actually that this is this particular issue is one where I think the, the, the perception on the ground is really quite different in the US versus the, the rest of the world. And we've not really returned to talk about QKD versus uh, PQC. Um, and quantum key distribution, the physics-based uh, solution, rather than the maths-based solution of PQC, uh, has got a lot more traction in Asia. You know, you've got the massive Chinese network, you've got uh, South Korea already in deployment, you've got uh, Japan very active, you've got uh, the European Union's Euro QCI uh, project planning QKD infrastructure across Europe. But in the US, it's more cleaved to, you know, the, the NSA's advice has been to avoid QKD. Uh, the UK's uh, National Quantum Security, uh, National Cybersecurity Center, similarly. Uh, and that's tended to push people towards, you know, other solutions, be it PQC, be it out of band entropy distribution, which is kind of what QCrypt are doing, uh, what quantum exchange is doing. Quantum um, exchange. Or to entanglement based solutions which is a more advanced quantum protocol which is uh you know that the 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 destination that many people would like to get to 
I like the out of band strategy because it simply makes it harder without really going through too much esoterics. And it and I liken it to multi-factor authentication. It kind of you add one other channel for uh, for 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 authentication. Uh, but the other thing I wanted to mention, and just in parentheses, is that when you talk vendors, you also bring in the idea of intellectual property and patented algorithms. And I think patented algorithms go strictly against standardization because once you have a standard, then you can demand compliance with the standard. But if the compliance requires that you pay patent royalties, that makes it all really entangled in a very difficult way, <laughs> pun intended. So that is another element of this whole thing as we move forward, because obviously it's a really big problem. It requires tremendous work. So you obviously want people who do it to have a way of getting compensated, but it's a complexity. Yeah, one thing I would say that's, that's related is it's sort of a personal bias, but I've heard this from many enterprise IT managers. You want to stay away from proprietary systems because proprietary systems may not be interoperable. You may want to mix multiple vendors. Uh, you want to have something that's been standardized. And, you know, the one good thing about, you know, what NIST has done is they've had their algorithms and they've had world-class cryptographers banging against those algorithms for five years now trying to find breaks so if you have some scheme that you've developed your own engineers have developed but it really hasn't been made open source and hasn't been opened up to the world you know it may not have gone through the same level of rigorous analysis and you know there may be a hidden flaw in it somewhere and and you know at the end of the day you want to Place your trust on something where the trust is, is based on the architecture and the design of it rather than the individual who designed the box. So uh, you, you want to minimize, you know, ex, you know, external because even if you use a cloud vendor, there could be some nefarious character at the cloud vendor who who's uh, doing bad things with your data. So uh, in general, people people would prefer uh, st standardized, you know, uh, system uh, algorithms that uh, are multi-source from multiple vendors. And uh, there, there are enterprise uh, solutions uh, starting to emerge as well. One example uh, up in Canada, Crontropy with James Nguyen. Uh, they have a source of entropy where they create a key and then two channels, one uh, symmetric, one asymmetric, one for secure data exchange and one for secure communications. All of that available in the cloud uh, as a service. Uh, is, is that the kind of uh, solution that we need? I think it's 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 one of the things that's that's a challenge about um, you know the, the, this this area uh, that uh, you know companies that you know companies and, and, and algorithms that have taken part in the standardization process as as Doug uh, you know refers to that as a you know an advantage for adopters that then can reference back to that and understand what the process has has been and then you've got companies that want to add additional innovation into that and sometimes that can be a good thing but you you have got to and i think it's it's the question you know doug was pointing to if you're going to adopt something which is uh on a different track like that you've got to be very sure that that you know who's done that validation for you or, or have you in your own organization got the got the ability to take that on and it's one of the places where potentially national programs uh uh you know hubs uh, centers and showcases can 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 help in this because they they provide a place where different parties you know innovators end users national authorities can come together to work together and start to build that type of confidence but certainly, I, I would, you know, I, I would, I would, you know, say to any uh, potential adopter out there, to be very careful that they understand the, uh, the the source of the advice they're taking to update their their plans on this, and how that's been checked, where they what, what they're really relying on to to validate uh, the, uh, the 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 claims of a particular system. Uh, the other thing really is that, so it, to me, it's like a, if you have it open source and everybody can bang on it, you gain confidence over time. 
because of just the statistical nature of having been around for so long. Uh, the flip side, of course, is that as you share it, you expose it, and then people can find holes in it that maybe they couldn't exploit if they never found it. So I also see way the other end of the spectrum where people do something completely custom that isn't shared with anyone, and they kept, keep it as a trade secret. And that also seems to have a play. But I think long term, what Doug is mentioning is probably what's going to win out. But I do see that other alternative, even in systems, for example. Like in the early days, if you had a Mac, it was a little bit more secure than PCs because there was just fewer Macs. The attack surface was smaller. Uh, even today, there are like people who build their systems out of FPGA and completely custom, different instruction set. It's not x86, it's not ARM. You don't even know how to get into that thing. And uh, it doesn't run Linux. It's just its own complete com custom thing that uh, you have to really know in advance to be able to crack. So I, it just shows the complexity. I'm, I'm reflecting on the, the, the debate we've had we've had so far. And I'm just conscious that I, I feel that I want to 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 make the case for, for, for QKD a little bit here. Um, because uh, you know, we, we've we've all said we've said a lot of things. That are the the pros about uh, you know PQC math based approaches, uh, standardized math based approaches, etc. We've said a lot about that. Uh, we've also referred to you know out of bands and the, out of band and there's there's a great case for out of band. You know Shaheen was pointing out it just it complicates the the harvest and decrypt later attack tremendously. Um, but QKD, let me let me point to what I consider where it's got some, some unique things that we should come back to. And I'm not blind to the downsides of QKD. Yes, it, it needs new hardware. Yes, that hardware it has in the past been relatively those days. There's, there's more commercially stable systems now. Uh, but it does come with it with a unique complementary promise. When I'm relying on, on PQC or some maths-based approach, I'm ultimately depending on one of those those computational assumptions. If I can combine that with a layer of security that's based on QKD, it brings a completely different promise into my system as a, as a layer of defense, a promise which is no longer based on a computational assumption. It's based on 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 the laws of physics, as the QKD guys like to say. And, and for a start, that's complementary. It, it just it's an extra layer that depends on a different thing. But it also comes correctly constructed in the right the right protocol it also gives me a very enduring promise because you know even if i allow that 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 the the power of future computers is going to continue to increase or i worry about algorithms being broken in the future unless my qkd uh exchange was compromised at the time it was done it's going to remain secure so it gives me a, a uniquely enduring security promise the the other thing that that I think is 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 actually a, 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 a subtle but geopolitically very relevant point is this split between the countries that are pursuing building QKD networks now versus countries that that aren't. And, and at one level, it's a decision about how do I want to try and build some quantum safe security for the relatively short term. But on the other hand, it's also a view as to does building that prepare and measure QKD network, i.e. the QKD we can do now, does that help me for building a future entanglement-based quantum internet? Because a lot of people think that's ultimately a much more significant thing. There's other things you can do with it, notably multiplying the power of quantum computing. So arguably that is really one of the winning high grounds of the quantum revolution. And if you take the view that the way to win in building the quantum internet is to get some experience along the way building prepare and measure qkd networks then you better get building them now and and i say that because kind of the us isn't and there's no, so, so not just governments but also companies are getting into that i, I think some, something else you wanted to talk about is this this doesn't just happen as a service in the cloud or through fiber networks it also happens in space um Arcid, who raised 400 million through a SPAC uh, very early on with the stated goal that by 2023 20, uh, next year, they'll have uh, satellites in space and uh, distribute their fully secure and mathematically proven keys uh, from space to anyone who wants it, right? Yeah, uh, both of you really well said, David and, and Andre. And I, I, you know, so security folks in general like multiple layers of security. So if you give them 
a net new way to defend that they will deploy it on top of everything else they're deploying it. And I think to the extent that KQD and of course quantum internet, which we must talk about in this context and others are net new ways of making it more secure on top of everything else we talked mm -hmm. about. So they will happen as soon as they are practical, even within a short distance, they will, they will be used. Uh, I think that was really well said. Nice. Yeah. To wrap up, uh, we'll uh, approach one final topic. Uh, this is not just about uh, keeping your data uh, safe or building the quantum internet, uh, to, to use uh, maybe a forbidden term still. Uh, uh, but uh, there's also this uh, concept or fear of if I use a quantum computer and, and I use it to you know, work on some of my critical processes or, or data sets on it, um, that might be a real problem because I'm, I'm giving away um, uh, the ground rules of, of my company, right? And uh, that's how the concept of blind quantum computing emerged. Um, can we use some of these same principles to keep the information that I might be sending to Rigetti, to IBM, to, to Microsoft, when hopefully they come out with their new topological device, not this year, but at some point, can I keep my, my computation safe, um, still get the result that I need, uh, but not to uh, jeopardize um, really my IP duck. Yeah, it's definitely a good point that, you know, a quantum internet is valuable for more than just security of uh, exchanging keys. Uh, even in the classical world today, some IT managers are nervous about using cloud systems. You know, they don't want to ship all their data to someone like Amazon or Microsoft. They're just worried that somehow something could happen and, and it could get released. So uh, in the classical world, um, people are actually studying something called homomorphic computing, which allows you to encrypt the data, do the processing, uh, and then ship it back. But even that, uh, if there's a bad person at the cloud vendor, they at least know the program that you're using for the for the processing. Uh, in quantum, you can go one step further, which is this thing called blind quantum computing, where not only can you encrypt the data, but you can encrypt the program too, so that even if someone uh, at one of these cloud vendors is copying down everything that you're doing, they still have no idea what, what the program is or what, what the data is. So there definitely is value there, and it certainly will I think we'll have a place. The other thing I would point out where a quantum internet can have some very interesting value is in networking sensors. You know, one example that I would use is um, there's something called LIGO, which was a network set up by Caltech and others for detecting gravitational waves. You know, they had one sense station in the state of Washington, another in the state of Louisiana. They collected some data and then they shipped it back and then they processed it together. Um, it would be much more valuable if they could ship entangled data or quantum level data for processing. So that could greatly increase the power of those types of systems. So I think you'll see uh, quantum internet used for sensors in the future also. Just a couple of comments on cloud usage is that a, uh, it's, it, while security is a big problem, and in fact, in many cases for many customers, cloud providers can do a better job of security than you can, and, and, and you should take advantage of it. Uh, however, there's also the question of governance, is that once you hand over your data to them, uh, if they block you out, the, you know, you, you, you're out of luck. Whether, you know, so you do need physical custody for a whole bunch of data. And then related to this is that egress costs for data in the cloud are really high, but they don't have to be. You know, there's no law of nature that says it's more expensive to take the data out than to put it in. That's just the business model. And we are seeing some cloud providers that are using that as a competitive advantage and in fact have very low egress costs. And I think that's going to equalize it and change the market as well. I, 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 I'm a big uh, supporter of the this. Uh, I, I see a lot of value in, in blind quantum computing on the cloud, as you know. And Doug was was describing it very well. I, I just think it's going to flag. Actually, there's been a couple of examples of uh, some use cases where where people really that's what they would kind of like, even if they don't know it yet. 
I, I'm struck that, you know, IBM are, are this year going to be installing one of their machines at the Cleveland Clinic, which I think is a very interesting, exciting initiative. Uh, but it's interesting, is it's one of the reasons why the Cleveland Clinic said they needed an on-premise machine. They needed an on-premise quantum computer because they were saying, oh, they were worried that people would, would, would be able to get a jump on what they were researching. But of course, that's exactly what, what that promise of blind quantum computing says they don't have to worry about. Once you can do that, you you can take that problem away. And, and equally, you look at you know another company I, I you know I, I follow and I've seen doing you know you know great things here in Europe, which is is multiverse computing, and you know they have a, a, a new solution which is they're they're putting into banks. And one of the things that their their marketing uh, uh, presentation or their their architecture has to go to some lengths to reassure the banks on at the moment is what exactly can happen inside the bank's perimeter versus what's going to go on outside the bank's perimeter. And again, once we've got blind uh, quantum computing on the cloud that can be done efficiently using these uh, uh, these uh, quantum protocols, you can you can help a lot of financial institutions in a way that you you can't at the moment because they're too nervous about wanting to keep keep control of their perimeter. Thank you. I'll uh, conclude uh, today's tour de force of uh quantum cryptography, finally got it uh, right, from QKD to entanglement, uh, services platform, satellite-based and blind quantum computing. What I loved about today's conversation, uh, it, it was very quantum. All, all these technologies and everything that we discussed here, uh, a serious technology, serious vendors, they all have pros and cons. There's no right or wrong. There, there rarely is ever any, any really bad and, and always a lot of good. It, it really depends in and, and, and quantum. It depends on what is your timeline, what is your need, and uh, a little bit what your philosophy is and, and what you believe in. So with that, uh, thank you so much, uh, James, David, Doug, Shaheen. We'll be back in four weeks. This concludes uh, the Analyst Roundtable, Season 1, Episode 3, Round and Round We Go. Round and Round We Go. You can find each individual's analyst research and analysis online at Quantum World Detangled. Dot com. We hope to see you soon. This concludes the Analyst Roundtable. Quantum is coming.